First Peter chapter 1. Okay, so, here's what I was thinking about. If you knew something was very important or groundbreaking and it was about to happen, wouldn't you want to see it? If you knew something was going to change the entire world, wouldn't you want to know what that was? And, and even if you couldn't be there, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to, to know about it anyways? Or if you're like me today, you're like, okay, well, it'll be on YouTube by the end of the day. So <laughs> if, it, if I'm not there, it's okay. But when cataclysmic things, life-changing things, world-changing things happen, we want to be on it. We're like the information crowd, you know. We just, we want to know everything. Well, look, the free gift of salvation from God to anyone is for all of mankind. Anyone can be saved. But this message of salvation as a free gift is nothing new. It's existed since the creation of of the world and God has not been silent about it at all. Now we have the benefit of possessing the complete Word of God. There's nothing more to add to the Word of God, there's nothing to take away from it. We've got it in its complete form and it's our privilege to look back and see how the story unfolded from creation all the way now to here, to you. But it's also a privilege to be saved. It's a privilege to be a Christian. Privilege, privilege. Why do I say that it's a privilege? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Of this salvation, the prophets, that's of course referring to those in the Old Testament, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Isn't that an interesting line? What does that mean? We'll come to that. Privilege, privilege. Webster's Dictionary defines privilege as a right or benefit that is given to some people and not to others. A special opportunity to do something that makes you proud. The advantage that wealthy and powerful people have over other people in society. That's the way privilege is defined by Webster's Dictionary, and that all makes sense. But there's a privilege as a Christian too, but it's not the same as the privilege of the world. Because it's not an advantage that we have because we're wealthy. It certainly is a special opportunity, but it doesn't necessarily make us proud. And it's not necessarily a right or benefit that's given to some and not to others. The fact is that if you're a Christian, you now possess something. Listen to this and think. You now possess something that many have foreseen but did not have and others will never have yet long to examine it. I'll explain as I go along. That's how God's Word describes salvation. What it means to be born again by God's Spirit. Okay, let's look, look at it like this. Point number one. It's in your handouts. It's up on the screen. And for the truly spiritual amongst you, you already knew this because the Holy Spirit revealed it to you. Just kidding. I, I, some of you are going, did he really mean that? <laughs> Is there anybody here like that? <laughs> Point number one, somebody peeked at your present. See, so, <laughs> salvation, salvation is nothing new. 
man has needed to be reconciled to God ever since the Garden of Eden. Okay, starting with the fall of man, God set in motion everything necessary to provide a way so that man could be reconciled back to God. It started in Genesis chapter 3, 15 with the promise of victory over Satan and was also exemplified in the sacrifice of the innocent for the guilty in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. The plan started to roll from the very beginning. It's nothing that took God by surprise. Oh, 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 they took the fruit. Oh, no, what are we going to do? You know, I mean, there's just, God doesn't panic in heaven when man does something. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't take him by surprise. It's an encouragement for you and me, by the way. You know, there's nothing that you can do that takes God by surprise. He doesn't panic when, when we do something stupid. And as soon as man did that, God's like, I got the plan. Here's the plan. Here's how it's going to roll out. And he told him what the plan was going to be. The thing is, the writers of the Old Testament, whether it was Moses or David, Solomon, Elijah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, take your pick, any of them, any of the writers of the Old Testament, they knew it. They knew about God's salvation. They, they knew that the Messiah would come and die for the sins of the guilty. It was clear to them, and perhaps no clear, and I've referred to this passage a lot, Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Come on! I mean, how can you possibly read a thing like that and not make the connection? That was written some 700 years before Jesus was even born. 700 years. They saw it coming. They knew it. There were prophecies about where he was going to be born. Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. What tribe of Israel he would come through. Genesis 49, 10, the tribe of Judah. What he would be called. He would be called Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. He would be God incarnate. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Or even his crucifixion in Psalm 22, 16 to 18 about his hands and feet being pierced. In the Old Testament, there's over... 350 direct passages that find their fulfillment in Jesus. They knew it. But here's the deal. They knew it, but they saw it from afar. They knew that it was something that was going to come, but it wasn't something that they currently possessed. That's kind of fascinating to me. They could see it coming, and they knew that it was for someone else. It was for you. They knew that it was for you and for me. The Old Testament prophets wrote what they saw under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Somebody peeked at your present. Somebody saw this coming. They knew in their mind, in their vision given to them by God, that somebody in the future, that many in the future, would be born again by the Spirit of God because of the sacrifice that God would make for their sins. That's you. Somebody peeked at your present. The salvation that we can enjoy now is nothing new. God made it known from the very beginning. Now, that's what the Apostle Peter says. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. It wasn't for them. They saw it coming. Now, that brings me to point number two, which is typically what happens after point number one. And that is... <laughs> Susie's like, oh man. <laughs> the jokes just haven't changed. <laughs> Point number two is it's, this is something worth looking into. Now, now note, uh, traveling from verse 10 into verse 11, this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. This is something that they looked into. Ser, ser, verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating. They were motivated, moved by the Holy Spirit to have this vision that God was going to reconcile man back to himself through the sacrifice of himself. 
So that through faith in him, that man could be reconciled back to God. The enmity that was between man and God could be taken away. Your sins could be forgiven. They saw that. And it's not like they just saw that and went, oh, cool. <laughs> What's for dinner? I mean, it's like it's like they saw this and it's like, wow, wow, wow. I I got to know more about this. This is this is groundbreaking. This is this this has changed the whole world. This will change the world that man can be reconciled back to God who created us. That's groundbreaking. So I got thinking about this too. I probably heard this somewhere, I can't remember. If there's no better use of your mind than to be occupied with the things of God. There's no better use for your mind than to be occupied with the things of God. <laughs> well, now, think about what occupies your mind. Or, or don't, <laughs> as the case might be. Even the simplest of things like, you know, what's, what's for lunch? Or, gee, you know, I guess I did have too much to drink last night. You know, I mean, what what's occupies your mind? But when we think about God, when we think about the things of God, the things that he has revealed in his word, and you guys know, anybody that's been attending this church for a while, we love just burying ourselves into the word of God and just dragging out of it everything that we can get out of it. And it, it never ceases to amaze me. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. We can sit here on Sunday morning or stand here on Sunday morning or, or Tuesday night or Thursday night and just squeeze these verses and there's always something new. I mean, it's just you never get to the bottom of this. It's like a mine that every time you swing the pick, every time you dig the shovel, you hit another mother load. There's always wealth to be gained from it. So when we occupy our minds, even just thinking about the things of God, meditating on the things that we've learned, allowing God's word to search our minds and our hearts, and then seeking to apply that, thinking it through. Well, gee, if this means this, then this means, you know, thinking it through, friends. You know, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's nothing better to do with your mind than that. And the Old Testament writers, prophets, and believers felt that what they saw coming was worth looking into. They weren't content just to have a glimpse of it. They had to study it. They searched for the details. It's interesting, too. It's a cert that word searching is used there in verse 11. Searching, searching. It means to investigate. It means to diligently search, to explore, I like that word, or to examine closely. God's word is not something that you just read it and then, oh, well, I finished that book, let's move on to the next book. God's word is one of those things you can come back to forever and ever for the entirety of your life. Never get to the bottom of it. Now, this is how they saw the things that we now possess. They saw it coming and they diligently searched into it, looked into it, explored it, um, examined it, investigated it. And now we are the possessors of the fulfillment of what they looked into. Does that make sense? Yes. Note as well that it was God's Holy Spirit called here the Spirit of Christ. I like that there in verse 11 who was guiding them in their search. Now, two things for you here, just to think about. One is that they inquired and searched carefully for what God promised. And the second is, they were guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, as those who now enjoy all the blessings and benefits of what they were investigating, should we investigate any less what we now possess. Yeah, you, you got to think about it just a little bit, don't you? See, God has supplied us with enough to investigate here that we're never going to get to the bottom of it in this life, and yet we are commanded to apply ourselves. If you back up 
just a few pages to 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Boy, talk about leveling up your walk with Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. God's word says this to you. Be diligent. There that idea is again. You know, you can't this you can't be lazy about this stuff. You got to dig in. This is hard stuff. And and especially I think, you know, when I was a brand new believer, I just gotten saved and you know, they handed me a Bible and I'm like, where do I even start? And I, you know, I'm reading stuff and I have no clue what any of this means. I'm reading, you know, and, uh, you know, this guy begat that person who begat that person who begat that person. And like, <laughs> you know, what is this, you know, with all these killing people and sacrificing animals? And what is all of this stuff about the future? I mean, it was just, it was mind bending. But I knew it was important, right? Do you know that it's important? Do you know that the Word of God is important? And because it's important, I applied myself to it. And I started to learn. I told you this before. I used to go to this midweek Bible study. And I remember going the first time. I, could, I didn't understand anything they were talking about. Nothing. But this guy's house was packed with people. And he was teaching so well that I thought, I didn't understand any of this, but I want to come back. And you know what? I kept coming back. And guess what? I learned. And then I started understanding what he was talking about. And I started going, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, this is that. And this goes with that. And this is connected to this. Bing, 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 bing. You know, the, and the lights start going off. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Sometimes... We don't talk to other people about Jesus because we don't know very much about Jesus. And we're afraid. And then sometimes somebody will say something like, well, what about this, this, and this? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> so sometimes we just don't open our mouths at all because we don't know. You know, somebody told me a long time ago, I told you this before, somebody told me a long time ago, if somebody asks you a question you don't know, you know what you say to them? Say, I don't know. But I'm going to find out, and I'll get back to you. Bring your question. Bring it here to church. There's all kinds of really smart people here at church that will help you understand what that question is. And then you can go back to them and say, hey, hey, I've got an answer to your question. Hey, hey, don't run away. I've got an answer to your question. Seriously, come back. It freaks people out when you do that. If you actually come back and say, oh, here's the answer. The answer is, look at this passage right here where it says this. That explains this other passage here. Do you believe now? <laughs> it's that easy. Um, also, 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. Where we're told, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and a brotherly kindness. Love. But how do you get there? Giving all diligence. You gotta work at it, friends. This is not something, being a Christian is not something that you just do on Sunday mornings for an hour or an and a half. This is this is all day. This is every day. This is your life. This is your eternity. Now, the big bonus here is that they had the Holy Spirit revealing these things to them and also helping them to investigate and understand them. Guess what? So do you. You got the Holy Spirit too to lead you and guide you into these things. Have you, Friends, have you ever sat down with God's Word and said, okay, Holy Spirit, okay, I'm here you inspired these people to write this word. Now you who inspired these people to write this word inspire me to understand it. You ever done that? You ought to. You might be surprised at what happens. 
You might be shocked and amazed when you're reading a passage and it makes sense. And and nobody told you what it meant. It just it it just illuminated. The light came on. It's the Holy Spirit of God. He'll do that for you. Invite him in to that diligence that you're applying to the study of God's word. Invite him into that. Get the Holy Spirit into this. In John chapter 14, turn over there. John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, Jesus makes us this promise. And I'm in John 14, verses 15 to 18, where Jesus says this to you and to me. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I love that. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. God promises his Holy Spirit to everyone who's been born again by the power of God. He follows up with that in John chapter 16. You're you're there maybe in the same section where your Bible's open. John 16 Verses 12 to 15. Now listen to what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit of God is going to illuminate your understanding into everything that God has revealed through his word. Now, there's no new revelation. God's not going to tell you, oh, we're going to add a 67th book onto the Bible. God's not going to do that. But he's going to illuminate your understanding so that as you study, you're going to learn and grow in your knowledge of what he's already revealed. Dig? Word. Look, we have this assurance. And that is, and I think I put it in your notes there, none of our studies in God's word will ever be in vain. You understand that? You cannot ever waste your time when you're looking into God's Word. When you're reading it, when you're studying it for yourself. It's always going to bear a dividend. Now you might walk away from this moment and say, well, I got nothing out of that sermon, as usual, from Brian. Um, you, You may walk away with that. But all of this, all of these little data points, all of these Bible passages, they're all rattling around in your skull. And at some point, God's going to bring it up. And if it hasn't happened to you before, it will. Where all of a sudden you'll remember something from church or from Bible study, from a devotion. Somebody said something, someone prayed something, a line from a song, a passage from Scripture. It just comes to your mind and you go, oh. Just like that. Oh. That's the Holy Spirit. Bringing up God's word that's rattling around in your skull. Isaiah 55, 11 says, God's word, when it goes out according to his purpose, it will return to him, accomplishing what he sends it out to do. So God's word is sent to you for a purpose. It says it won't come back void. God's word, as it's sent out to you, will accomplish exactly what God intends it to accomplish. Do you understand that? Do you understand that, that all of this is sent to you each one of you, for a purpose, and that God's purpose will be accomplished as you study this. Isn't that fascinating? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, God's word, the Bible, is alive and living, sharper than any two-edged sword. You understand that? This is not just ink on a page. It is. It's ink on a page. I mean, if something happens to this book, it's no big deal. I'll get another one. Okay, the, the, the paper isn't holy. The ink isn't holy. The, the genuine calfskin 
It's, it's, it's not holy. It's a <laughs> I bought this Bible because it's genuine calfskin. And my mom, I showed it to my mom, who's a vegetarian. <laughs> and she goes, that is so soft. I said, it's made out of dead baby cows. <laughs> and she's like, why would you even say that? It's, it's, it's what it is. You ever had veal? What do you think that is? Susie's like, no, no. Jesus has told us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. So examine your level of diligence in this, okay? Examine your level of diligence. If we want to level up, you know, that is to elevate our walk with Christ, then shouldn't the diligent study of his word be at the very top of the list? God's word, empowered by God's Holy Spirit, straight into your skull. I think that's pretty cool. And God's word doesn't stay there either. It sinks deep into your heart. It transforms you from the inside out. Like what Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 talks about, the renewing of our mind. Look, look. Some of the stuff that I've done, I needed my mind to be renewed. I lived through the 70s. What little of it I can remember, I, I, is my brain just needed to be completely flushed. The Old Testament writers considered this stuff worth looking into. Do you? Even if you're not a Christian today, even if you joined us here this morning in church and you thought, hey, there's a church, let's walk in there, it can't be all that bad, it's so small. Even if you're not a Christian and you walked in here today, we're talking about something that's worthy of your investigation as well. Because what we're talking about is your eternity. What happens to you when you die? And we're talking about decisions that you make in this life which determine your eternal destiny. So even if you've walked in here today and you're not a Christian, this stuff is worthy of your investigation as well. It's the most important topic in the world because it involves your eternity. Thirdly and lastly, and that is the unintended privilege. The unintended privilege. So we've got this salvation that God started from the Garden of Eden the Old Testament writers and prophets saw it coming, they investigated it diligently, and now it's fulfilled in your lives and mine. Anyone who's been born again by the Spirit of God. And, and we come to this here in verse 12 where it says, To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which you have now uh, been reported to through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. God let them know, this isn't for you guys. You're preparing all of this for somebody. And that somebody is you. They were preparing all of that for you. And it was sent to us by God's Holy Spirit from heaven. So this faith that we now stand in was determined by God from the very beginning. No surprises along the way. It's been revealed to and through His people over time and is now recorded for us in the pages of Scripture. This is what we preach and teach, especially in this church. And this is what you have believed, even if you're just beginning, even if you're a brand new Christian. You haven't been a Christian very long. You don't know a whole lot of stuff. That's okay. That's okay. This is what we're into. But this is far more than just words on a page. It's far more than just a religion, just something to believe. This is where the power is. This is where the power is. Note again the inclusion for the second time here of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's mentioned there in verse 12. Holy Spirit's mentioned there in verse 11. This is where the power is. Now this is the fulfillment of what Jesus had promised back in John chapter 14. He won't leave us as orphans. He's going to send his Holy Spirit not only to be with us, but to be in us as well. I dig that. That uh, scripture makes some fascinating declarations about the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with us. He's going to be in us. He's going to come upon us. I love that. So this is the fulfillment of that. And apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, I'm saying this is where the power is. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, you're kind of stuck where you stand. 
You're not going anywhere without the power of the Holy Spirit. Or worse, you will go somewhere without the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's an awful lot of churches that do that anymore. Look, I'm not saying we're the perfect church or anything. Maybe. <laughs> we got good snacks. And that counts for a lot. And we're nice people once you get to know us. It takes time. Just give it time. But I think, I think, I believe that there's a lot of churches out there that are going great guns, but the Holy Spirit just ain't really there. It just seems like it's just kind of flat and just kind of lifeless, maybe kind of powerless. And, and, I, and I, I, I want and I pray all the time that this would be a place where the Holy Spirit's free to do what he does. We pray this all the time. That the Holy Spirit would just be free to be who he is and do what he does. Transform lives, save souls, make disciples, heal bodies, whatever. Just do what he does. Because without him, we're stuck. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us to Jesus for salvation. John chapter 16, verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says, No one can confess Jesus as Lord but by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that, uh, that empowers us for life. I love Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, where God's word says, Not by power, nor by might, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That Spirit, that Spirit, that's who you have dwelling in you. That's who you have with you. That's who you have coming upon you for power. It's the Holy Spirit that grows God's fruit in your life. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us pray when we don't know how to pray. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It's the Holy Spirit that gifts each and every one of us with His gifts to be able to edify and build up the church and other believers around us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. One of the great privileges of being a Christian is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest privileges of all. This is not something where God just says, just believe this and just do it, and if you get it all right, then you'll get to heaven. God says, look, I'm going to give you some things to do. I'm going to command you some things to do, and you're not going to be able to do them. So I'm going to fill you with my power, thus enabling you to do anything that I tell you to do. Yep. You can't ever say, I can't do that. You can't ever say, but I couldn't help it. You can't ever say that. If you're a Christian. Oh, you can say, well, yeah, I sinned and I did it willfully. But don't give me that. Oh, I couldn't help it. Look, I know it's a struggle. And sometimes some things are more of a struggle than other things. I get that. But don't you think the Holy Spirit's going to help you with that too if you want to? If you want to? If you want to be free from the things that bind you, you know, the, the sins that you keep stumbling in over and over and over again and you keep praying for God's forgiveness over and over and over again? Holy Spirit's going to help you with that. Do you know that maybe the Holy Spirit is leading you to rehab? Do you ever think about that? <laughs> maybe the Holy Spirit is leading you to get some professional counseling? Think about that. No, no, I'm just going to suffer here until the Holy Spirit heals me. He's telling you to get up and do something. Don't just sit there. It's one of the greatest privileges of all, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. But there's another privilege here. And I would say it's a rather unintended one, at least from our point of view. And I'm closing with this. And it's right there at the very tail end of verse 12. Things which angels desire to look into. What a fascinating verse. What on earth does that mean? I mean, an angel, angels are created beings. We get that. We understand that. I've taught on that here before. They're created beings. So they're higher than man, but they're lower than God. They're eternal beings. They can appear. They can disappear. They, you know, they're not magic. They're just transcendent. You know, they're not bound by material time and space. But we also know, too, because of Satan and those that followed him, that with an angel, it's one and done. If you sin, you're out. Period. That's it. There's no repentance for an angel. An angel can't say, forgive me. Can't do that. 
I've thought about that a lot. And I kind of think one of the reasons why, this is just my opinion, so don't take me, take this for gospel. But sometimes I think that the reason there's no repentance for an angel is because of the great privileges that they've been given. They've been given the privilege of dwelling in the, the same place that God dwells. Having direct access to God Almighty anytime, all the time. And because of their great privileges, when they violate that privilege, that's it. One and done. So think about this for a second. Think about this. Angels desire to look into this. The whole idea, follow me here, the whole idea of the guilty being saved from the penalty that is due to them, that's us, and having the crucified and risen Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith and being filled with God's Holy Spirit is completely foreign to an angel. They got no clue. They've never been born again. There was never a need. There was never an opportunity for them. They're not filled with God's Holy Spirit. We are. They don't have the crucified, resurrected Christ dwelling in their hearts by faith. We do. They don't. Angel can look at it, glorify God for it, but never comprehend or understand it because they'll never experience it. I kind of got this kind of funny idea in my head, and I could be completely wrong. But I just wonder if we don't get to heaven and have angels come up and say to us, you know, what, what's it like? What's it, what's it like to be born again? What is, what is that? What did that feel like? What, is it, what does that feel like? Jesus, Jesus, I mean, Jesus. What does it feel like to have Jesus living in your heart? The Holy Spirit of God with you, in you, upon you. What is that like? What are we going to say? Are we going to say, oh, um, yeah, you know, I don't know. It was, you know, it was, it was cool, I guess. <laughs> are we going to get to heaven and go, dude, it was awesome I got let me tell you how long do you have oh, eternity let me tell you oh oh Jesus dwelling in my heart by faith let me tell you let me tell you how he saved me let me tell you how I got saved let me tell you what it meant to me let me tell you what I experienced every day with the Holy Spirit of God empowering me to do what he commanded me to do and I got to do it and I went out and I did it and he did it. He empowered me to do it. Oh, and the angels are like, oh, praise God. I got you. What a thing that you got to experience. Is that a privilege? Yes, but it's an unintended privilege because you know what it is? It's the privilege of the condemned being set free. That's what it is. It's the privilege of the condemned set free. Because that is what we are apart from Christ. Condemned. We've condemned ourselves. Our sins have condemned us to an eternity apart from God. And when we're born again by the Spirit of God, we're set free, we're saved from having to pay that penalty ourselves and we're given the gift of eternal life with Him, in Him, we are the condemned who have been set free. Is that a privilege? Yes. Does that mean that I'm not guilty? Ah, wait a second. I still did all of that stuff, right? But I've been set free from having to pay the penalty for it. There's penalties here on earth, right? We call those consequences. Anybody ever suffered the consequences of their actions? Three people, four people. Okay, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've been set free from the eternal consequences of our failures, our sins, our violations of God's law. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus said, The Son of Man, speaking of himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what he did. He gave his life as a ransom for many. It's interesting. That idea of ransom means to buy out of slavery for the purpose of setting free. 
That's what that means. Ransom means the price paid for redeeming captives, loosing them from their bonds, and setting them at liberty. It applies spiritually to the ransom paid by Christ for the delivering of men from the bondage of sin and death. Don't you love that? Did you get that? Tell me you love it. Just lie to me. Say you love it. I love it. It applies spiritually to the to the ransom paid by Christ for the delivering of men from the bondage of sin and death. Today, if you've been born again, you enjoy all the privileges of a condemned person that has been set free. It does not make you guiltless, only free. He sets you free from it. Jesus took our guilt upon himself as the Old Testament prophets foresaw. And today we live in the privileged position of relying on him daily for everything that we need. Is that a privilege? You bet. But like the world, does that privilege make us proud? Mm, quite the opposite, doesn't it? Because I'm not a wealthy person that enjoys privileges that everybody else in society doesn't. This is not something that I've done that I'm proud of. Quite the opposite. Rather what it does is it humbles me. Because I've brought nothing to this equation at all except my sin and my guilt. And he sets me free from the eternal penalty of that. What do I have to be proud of? I'd say nothing. Rather... This privilege helps lay the foundation for a life lived by faith. That foundation that we've been building on since verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start summing up next week. So as this is a privilege that we enjoy now, this salvation that lays the foundation for an entire life lived by faith. So make sure you're here next week too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're grateful for what you've done for us because we're, we're guilty and we know it. But Lord, just the thought, thinking about you dying on the cross to take upon yourself all of my guilt, all of my shame, all of my pain, all my secrets, all my public humiliations. Lord, we are humbled to the ground for what you've done for us. We're blessed beyond measure. We're privileged that your Holy Spirit now dwells within us and is with us forever. Now, Lord, help us diligently explore and examine these things growing in our minds growing in our hearts learning how to actually do these things in our daily lives Lord we can't wait it's so exciting give us hearts Lord that want to diligently examine these things only you can do it and you promise you would by your Holy Spirit and because we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen.